in patients treated with ibrutinib monotherapy, um, I believe, you know, the perfect candidate is somebody that is elderly, um, older than 65. And the reason for that is because it's a drug that you need to take continuously. So if you are choosing to give it frontline or in relapse refractory setting to a patient that is in his early 50s, you might be exposing the patient to a daily drug um, that may come with associated toxicities that we don't see initially, but that we may see over time, like grade three or grade four hypertension, arthralgias, bleeding events, um, arrhythmias. So this is the reason why um, certain patients may do better also in combination, trying to achieve a deeper response so that they can be off the, combina the, the drug at, at some point. Particularly in patients with high-risk disease, over and over again, we're seeing that different clinical trials are showing that people with 17p deletion, unfortunately, even though they respond beautiful to ibrutinib, they're the ones that will relapse the earliest than compared to everyone else, compared to 11q deletion patients or complex karyotype patients. Um, so in particular, for these 17p deletion patients, combination strategies would be best. And uh, I think there's many clinical trials right now currently evaluating the role of combination in this high-risk patient group. Um, other patients that may not be um, good at candidates for ibrutinib may be people that have history of a recent bleed, uh, particularly due to a major hemorrhage from major surgery or from um, intracranial bleed. So maybe those patients may not be um, good candidates for the use of ibrutinib, even monotherapy or in combination regimens. So those would be uh, ones that I would consider the use of another drug such as venetoclax, for example.